OK, so these are the questions this morning that I said we would be talking about today. The first one is, what's necessary to integrate uh, data sets and evidence into the EHR uh, for clinical use? The answers we came up with were, A, we need to pay attention to both scalability and access, because I think those, that, those were both important issues. Uh, we need to sh share decision support logic, if not algorithms, and make a publicly available library of these that would be uh, able to, people would be able to add from and, and take, take uh, algorithms out of. We need the ability to draw from uh, multiple sources, wherever they are, and integrate them. So whether it's Ensemble or ClinVar or whatever data set, we need, then are going to have to have data standards that are uh, required to actually uh, integrate across those sites. And we'll see a recommendation about that in a, in a few minutes. Um, we heard very clearly, and I think this is really an important point, we are not doing a very good job with the better val uh, validated tests that we already know about. Uh, we heard a lot of discussion about the BRCA tests and a variety of others. So we should start with those. I mean, those are ones that are pretty high on the list already. And if we can't get those in and uh, use, do those in a useful way, uh, we're really not doing our job. And then we wanted to ask the question, um, and, and I don't know, Jim, maybe you can just hit, if there maybe they're just a yes answer. I mean, is, is ClinVar an honest broker for variant information? And is that a role for ClinVar? Yes. <laughs> Good. We've answered one of the questions. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, from that session, uh, did any things that were missed that people can think of? Brad. I just want to ask, we haven't really talked much about somatic mutations and the role there. Is that, are we kind of taking that for granted? I mean, that's really where, you know, some of these processes will actually be driven first maybe in the, on, from oncologists and um, do we need a little more emphasis on that? Uh, it's a great question. So we should, we should add, you know, what is the role of, uh, can somebody, uh, Aaron or Terry, can you just make a note of that? <clears throat> Anything else from the first section? Uh, sorry, yes, what a good idea. I would, I would add that from the clinical decision support perspective, trying to keep uh, recommendations above the line in terms of standard format for how to describe clinical decision support versus uh, the technical implementation of that. So uh, across Cerner, Epic, GE, we each have different ways of implementing decision support. None of us are very likely to make deep changes underneath the hood. So. You know, I like the examples that Howard gave on his table that seemed pretty nicely defined for dosing recommendations. So if efforts are focused on very clear presentation so that any, any organization using any EHR system can then read that guideline, that would be my, my strong recommendation for the approach. So I assume the idea is that this, this library would be a, sort of a library of decision support logic that could then be implemented in whatever system. That's right. My recommendation, focus more on the logic rather than the implementation right. of the logic. Let, the, let each system uh, focus on how to implement, focus on very clear, precise description of the logic. I'm, I'm not sure you mean honest broker when you say honest broker down there, because that's got a very specific meaning for ethically controlled data. And there's nothing in ClinVar itself which is in that category. Uh, I mean, so the what uh, it, the, the concept was to be the place where you could, uh, if there were two uh, conflicting pieces of data, the, I think the plan was that both of those data right. sets just, would appear. I'm just saying that that it's just that it's just that phrase on its broker has a very okay. specific meaning. Okay. Okay. So. Great. <laughs> Alan, I, I was going to say I think in terms of. Um, um, evaluating the evidence base to decide what's implementable. I think that whoever the committee is or whoever the body is needs to make sure that they're calibrated with what actual clinicians believe is the 
required evidence base because in the end, that's where the rubber hits the road. Yeah, I think that we should, that would go under one of the ones actually from yesterday's discussion, I think, but yes. Grant Wood with Intermountain Healthcare. Uh, I also work with HL7 Clinical Genomics Work Group. We've developed uh, data modeling standards and, and, and data transmission standards around sending genetic test results from the lab to the EHR. I'd like to make the suggestion that we add a bullet that this group help uh, further pilot and test that data standard. Uh, that could be really helpful. That's all. Yeah, and I think one of the things that came up at the workshop, I'm completely forgetting when it was, but we had a workshop on electronic health records and genomics that NHGR sponsored in April or something, or October, or... <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, I think one of the important things for me that came out of that was I don't think the genomics community is talking to the medical informatics community, uh, so we need to bring those two groups together. I think that's a really important uh, point. Relative to that, the comment was made, yeah, the billions of dollars right now, billions, you know, 50, 60 billion dollars right now is being spent in this country to build a new information infrastructure for healthcare. It's being spent. It's out there. There's all these different initiatives. If, and gen genetics could be part of the intellectual driver to make it realize that we have to build a different system than we have now. What we're doing now is we're building an interstate highway system that just connects the repair shops. We're building something that just connects hospitals and doctors, okay? That is not gonna work. We need a network so you can go anywhere you want to go and get the information you need. If, you know, so I think if you made a recommendation agency, earlier. If the agency can go out there and say, look, can we, I know this is probably politically difficult, but you're spending all these billions of dollars. Can you give us just a little bit so we can try to coordinate this in a way that makes sense? Because if we go down this path of just connecting hospitals and doctors, we're not going to have what we need going forward. The, the, and there is a recommendation that addresses that very directly okay. coming up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's do back here first. Hi, Luc Lucia Hendorf, NHGRI. So there have been a few comments made about identifying and interpreting genetic variants in the context of specific populations, such as those representative of the population at large. So I know there are a few of us that are familiar with the curation of GWAS data. So for example, I do the NHGRI GWAS catalog. Um, and where those populations are captured in GWAS, we definitely have those. But I think it's important to note that in the follow-up literature, where there's a lot of additional studies um, looking at, looking further um, at whether these variants generalize, is, is not captured by us and I think by the scientific community at large. Um, so we may want to note that that's an, a gap of existing databases. So I think probably what we should do on this slide is add a bullet for capture broader population coverage. Helen. One of the things that I thought um, w didn't really come out very clearly to me at least is in, in this situation where essentially there's one of considerable debate and uncertainty uh, that gets resolved into guidelines, it would actually be a really good idea if there were mechanisms in place for the longer term follow up. Uh, to see what actually the clinical outcomes for patients were, uh, for example, uh, in those found to have certain uh, rare variants, but which were considered at that time to not be of sig clinical significance. So, for example, Professor Raman has outlined how, in her framework, she's able to achieve that. But I think that's something that would be quite important, and I'm not at all clear how you would achieve that. Uh, in your system, have you had any thoughts about it, that? I think that comes under the, the, the looping yeah. discussion, so maybe we can revisit that in just a second, maybe like next. Anything else on this? Any other comments on this particular? Let's go ahead and move forward. Okay, so the question is how do we create a dynamic loop that recognizes the anticipated rapid increase in available evidence and upgrades clinical action and ability validity recommendations? So I think th this is that sort of loop that you were just referring to. So the recommendations here were establish something for the sake of nothing else than a name, a clin action curation function to build upon ensemble, clinvar, and other relevant databases. So one of the functions of that might be to make sure that we're capturing, as we talked about yesterday, the one-off um, examples and to make sure that things that are put into, you know, <coughs> bin three have a way of getting, or bin two A have a way of getting upgraded to 
the other the other bins? I, I think that was the is that capture what you were asking? And I think that it really relates to the decision. last bullet that you haven't gotten to, where yeah. we really talk about um, how do we um, design studies and design data collection to basically define and uh, obtain data on outcomes uh, as things yeah. move into the clinical space. I mean, that's what we need to capture uh, well in that last bullet. Uh, need to maximize interactions between epidemiologists and informatics genomics uh, investigators to facilitate obtaining needed information on clinical validity. Again, that's probably also a related thing. A key part of that is probably to uh, establish a training program that crosses these disciplines. That's one way to make sure that we bring people together. Uh, there was concern about data loss and privacy threats and how that hinders research, so uh, we need to make sure that it's clear that there are strong guidelines. I mean, there actually are strong guidelines, but that it, they're reinforced, that that gets in the way of our ability to actually do the kind of work that we want to do. Patient portals seem to be an important part of what we have going forward. Uh, we need patients to be actively engaged, um, and we need them to actually argue for data access for research. Uh, that is one way of sort of getting past some of the research clinical interface issues and uh, will also feed back to a prior recommendation that we need to uh, encourage uh, NIH, NHGRI perhaps in specific, but to actually stimulate these discussions with OHRP and other appropriate sites. Um, that ClinVar should incorporate uh, what bin a variant is in currently and it may, I think we heard that ClinVar was planning to do that uh, earlier. Uh, and then we need to collaborate with larger data warehouses, for example, what we heard from Medco today, uh, to conduct large-scale studies to get, uh, to better evaluate the outcomes. And Medco is just one example. Uh, we need to, as much as we can, find out where these other uh, sites are and engage them fully as well. And this is a great opportunity for an international collaboration. There, nope. Uh, okay. So this is on the loop. So the, okay, so um, uh, questions related to this, Tim. So on that thing about data loss, I mean, there's a kind of opposite to that, that, that if you get trapped in that, there's a huge opportunity to create, to use these data sets and create sort of virtual cohorts if you can do the informatics and if you're not blocked by those kind of things um, that will just enable, you know, make it easier to deliver the sort of clin action duration. So are you saying that by having the appropriate security finding models actually in place, well, we can finding, go a federated approach? Finding ways to lower the transaction cost for doing a study and then, you know, doing a virtual selection, analyzing the data to ask a specific, specific question. If you've got to go through all these hoops, then you just, people just don't do it and that data is wasted. Yeah. Um, Our, so I agree with all of those. Um, I was just wondering, they all sound a, a little passive in terms, I don't mean that in a critical way, in the sense of being able to uh, set up these infrastructures so that you can have the information. Um, but I'm a I would like to see, I don't know whether it's the remit of this group, to see something proactive in thinking about how we're actually going to um, assign bins or decide on the in silico programs that we need and, and, and thinking about how we're going to get the people together to do that, how we're going to fund that. Um, I'm not sure whether that's on the next. There are some, I think some of those, maybe you revisit this when we get to the, there's a couple of slides that are sort of more action item oriented at the end. So I've got, go, I've got go ahead. a few things that, that I think are more than just wordsmithing. On the concern about data loss, it hinders both research and clinical care. And I think that's an important concept. And the other is under collaborating with larger data warehouse, warehouses, again, I, I want to emphasize broadening the concept that really what we need is what uh, some have already exists in Europe, is, is national disease registries, where all the data is out there and it doesn't matter where the patient goes, it's trackable and, and the better research can be done. And clinical care can be, there can be continuity of clinical care. You don't want to add a national uh, electronic health care system, a health record to that? <laughs> Physicians have unique identifiers now. We're yeah. required in the United States to have a number. I no longer have a name. I'm just a number in a database. 
and, and I've forgotten who it was, was mentioning that, 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 that there's a, a health system where every patient has a, has a unique identifier. Scotland. So, But that changes with your, it I mean, changes, right. Rob has his own number that he's created, and, and I think we should just operationalize that. Could, could I just say in relation to registers, we don't talk that way anymore. We talk about queries. You just don't need to create a registry to store particular data. You just run the query every hour or every day or every week. But at the same time, we do have specialist registries. Yeah, for no, the I, different, I, yeah. I agree, but it, we were getting away from those very quickly. But, but we don't have that big overarching uh, data warehouse that you have. So in, we can't... Medco do. Well, they, they have... You know, they have, what was it, 50 million of them, and Blue Cross Blue Shield has 99 million of them, and... And they have data gaps, um, too. Yeah. I mean, the Medco doesn't have all the data on all the patients, and so you have to recognize what data is available or not. Uh, Robert? I mean, it's a great idea. I mean, we'd love to have that. I was thinking maybe the thought would be to do something like the, the um, FDA-funded Sentinel program. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but yeah. what they did there was to say... Um, you know, fund a center, in this case, I think it's Harvard, Richard Platt has this, um, and um, when they're looking at rare safety events related to drugs, send it to the coordinating center who sends it out to the approved Medco-like entities who then do the analyses based on a protocol everyone's agreed to, so it's the same data, and they come back and they pool it so they're able to look at questions, something like that in genomics that would be international, uh, with some funded entity or coordinating centers or something that had people who agreed to be part of might be an interesting thought. So what we might be able to operationalize that is to explore existing data aggregation models uh, that are, you know, not purpose specifically for genomics to say which of those could be potentially adopted or adapted uh, for use in the space that we're interested in. Helen. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the thing that, that's critical to that, um, <clears throat> given that you have different providers with different IT systems, is the common data model. That's the first step that has to happen, because essentially what they're doing is just sending out generic code to run on pretty well-standardized data models, uh, and then just essentially pulling the estimates from the models, rather than actually having to capture any individual level data. And that's you know, pretty well worked. I mean, we do that already for when we do meta-analyses. We write just generic scripts, but we get everybody to agree a data format in advance. So there's quite a lot you can do, but the first step is to have interoperability and agreement on nomenclatures. You know, it's, it's all doable stuff. Right. And the NHGRI, in some ways, yeah. has already taken its first step in this, in the eMERGE, because one of the things that eMERGE is doing is to have an individual center uh, develop some type of an algorithm to be able to extract a specific piece of clinical data, but the um, uh, uh, the requirement is, is that it has to run in all the other centers. And so we actually have a little test laboratory that could potentially um, be scaled to try and answer some of these bigger questions. Other questions on the loop function or suggestions? Uh, next question was, what decision support and physician education will be needed in the clinics? I think the discussion on this said that we want to system to send, this is sort of the, the Gale uh, suggestion from this morning, we want a system that you can send sequences to that will guide provider to focus on relevant variants. I think we've talked a lot about the infrastructure that might lie underneath that, but actually th that's a, a, a nice goal to work towards. We need to further explore provider education. I think that probably ends up being a topic for a whole other workshop and set of discussions. Um, the the uh, clinical si decision support systems need to be scalable rather than institution specific, uh, and we need to explore open models and patient c open open models, uh, both for si decision support and and more broadly, and patient controlled information. Yeah, I think you know we were as we were discussing at lunch. The second bullet is a pretty wimpy bullet. Uh, I think what we really need to do, as I look at this now, is to say we need to explore innovative. Uh, education models, and we need to measure their effectiveness. So we need to basically try out new things and see what works and what doesn't, and really move away from uh, always defaulting back to the usual uh, suspects, which we know don't work. Other comments?
All right, so, oh. David has one. Yeah, I think I was probably intimidated by the wimpy comment. Um, <laughs> I think maybe a, a sort of more beefed up uh, educational strategy to try to bring the education to the clinic and to build you your microphone and talk to, uh, you know, work with a practice for a period of time and provide feedback to their early experience with uh, trying these new technologies. So basically, I think what you're saying is, uh, you know, explore the opportunities for pilot programs in, in the real world to uh, to use those as learning laboratories. Yeah, you know, I mean, we have done 15 traditional CME meetings related to pharmacogenomic training, and they're they're very helpful to get started, but the the problem is that, you know, they. Uh, have an impact for a month or two, and then there's a gradual attrition of focus. And what I think we're trying to do now, and I think it was a good strategy, is to build in an ongoing interaction and to build it related to the actual practice that the clinician's involved with. And I think, again, NHGRI does have a, a, a sort of a, a laboratory in which some of that's being done through both eMERGE and then the interactions between eMERGE and PGRN, which are uh, becoming increasingly robust. So that's one place that some of that could be piloted. Just to flesh out this idea of, of strengthening the education bullet, um, I think that's an area where the debate that Nazneen, Nazneen I pronounce it right, uh, and I had, uh, it's certainly testable to find out what are the outcomes of, for a variant where you're not sure what it means, to in some cases return an answer of saying, treat it as negative, versus in other scenarios, come back and say, treat it as intermediate, we're not sure what to do. So exploring different methods of reporting, exploring the education and instruction and wording of the report as it comes back, including management recommendations, and bringing that back in the research environment and looking at what happens as an outcome, I think are concrete steps, and maybe this gets into the next question as well. Those are concrete steps that can be taken to shed more light on these debates. We're gonna put your name next to that one, and you'll, you'll have ownership of that particular uh, context. Um, oh, sorry. We've talked a, a bit over the last few days about how, um, as geneticists, um, we made the sort of preciousness about genetic information and how that's coming back to bite us a little. Um, and I wonder, in, in terms of the education, whether sort of trying to reverse that a bit would be very helpful. Uh, certainly when I'm talking about clinicians about using genetic information, getting into mainstream, some of the things I say is, well, look, you're doing it all the time. Every time you diagnose a Marfan or a Down syndrome or whatever, you're, you're, if it was a clinical manifestation of a genetic uh, variant, you don't have any problem with it. Um, and I wonder whether some of those things we can try to readdress so that people are sort of more comfortable about it. Yeah, the whole genetic exceptionalism problem. Okay, uh, so now as to the list, there's a, a two slides here that f uh, focus on what NIH, Welcome Trust, et cetera, could, could think about doing. Um, some of these will sound familiar because they are sort of reiterations from this morning. Uh, first is to serve as a convener in conjunction with other NIHICs and professional standards organizations to foster discussions on clinical validity and actionability, to ensure that variants placed in BIN2 have identified pathway, an identified pathway to move out of BIN2 into either BIN1 or BIN3, to create and support a, a resource for clinical annotation that extends ensemble ClinVar and captures variants of unknown significance and one-off variants and the condition they're associated with. So this would be the clin action uh, resource that we talked about earlier. Ensure that discovery of disease gene and gene drug associations continues through funding initiatives. That means just making sure we're continuing to do more fundamental work that gets those, more of those associations out there. Uh, to target research discoveries discovery research to determine uh, clinical validity and actionability, catalyze, dis catalyze discussion with OHRP regarding IRB guidance, that was from this morning, uh, coordinate with AHRQ, the Office of the National Coordinator, VA, DOD, and where possible commercial EHR vendors in this EHR integration topic, organize a workshop on data structures data standards for clinical use of variant data, and to maximize ongoing interactions among existing and probably should say uh, new databases as they come along. 
consider training program integrating genomics and informatics and probably maybe even epidemiology and maybe even medical informatics. Uh, and then a policy analysis to determine and then develop policies needed for implementation of variants in clinical care. So then maybe I'll start with you, Nazneen. Did that capture, did those two, did that more address your, our, our passive nature, <laughs> our passiveness? <laughs> Sorry. Passivity? Um, <clears throat> I think it get, I can't remember who said it, this, this sort of central issue about deciding what is clinically valid that in, uh, and the complications of having sequence variation which is increasing on a, at an exponential scale and how we actually go into uh, um, decide what bin they're in um, and uh, all of the in silico things that were set up in a sort of general way were set up to not really look at whether it's clinically having an effect in humans they're looking at different things so I, I think we're trying to use a lot of things that already exist and existing paradigms, and I'm not clear that we've looked at it from the, that if we were going to look at it from fresh, whether those are the things that we'd actually use. But none of them, I think, are going to give us what we really need. So I don't have the answers, and I, I don't know whether, I, but I really think it's a really important focus for us to try and address. I would say that the fourth bullet point to me is exactly that point, that that's what I think the workshop needs to get to the data model that uh, is going to be exchanged or tested and the methods and data sufficiency to actually answer that question more than just interoperate in exchange among databases. We do that already. I know this is wordsmithing, but the words, words are important. In the third bullet, <coughs> it's not EHR integration. It's data interoperability, data liquidity. We'll never integrate EHRs, but if we can get data... The integration of data into EHRs. Let's but. just, can we just say data, <laughs> data integration or data liquidity? Um, because, uh, how do, interoperability, interoperability, but please just take the, EHRs are only one source of information. And if, if, we, if we just integrate EHRs, we have not developed, we won't be able to do the things you want to do. If, if I could just comment on that specific point. Um, so I, data is not enough because it's pretty easy with current EHR vendors to get data out. It just, it's very, very well proven that if you require clinicians to use a separate system that uses that data, they will not use it and you won't have impact. So we have to integrate with the actual user interface for clinicians who are using EHR. So I, I, maybe the wordsmithing would be in EHR and other health information system integration or along those lines. But I think it's important, we have to realize that even though the US used to not use many EHRs because the federal government pumped billions of dollars into it, we are getting much more adoption. And it's just a reality that we're gonna to need to deal with. And it just, it, this will come up again, but we don't have to get the final wording on these today. We will send the, you know, these will be massaged and sent around for people's feedback. So you'll have more opportunity. Helen? I sort of feel we've kind of danced around this issue that um, Elaine has raised and that also um, Professor Raman has raised and that somebody um, in the French horn section, as he's referred to, uh, raised. <laughs> oh, there you are. You may, you, you <laughs> may have, you, it again. <laughs> you, may, you may have already beaten me to the punch. I think the trombone well, may have entered before the punch. <laughs> well, what, what I wanted to, what I, um, what I sort of feel that we haven't articulated, and I don't know what the answer to this is because it's not quite my, my area, but it, what information is needed in order to create greater sense of security about the decisions about these variants that are of uncertain significance? What, what are the data? What are the designs? What are the methods of inference from the data? that need to be in place to improve those decisions. And I feel that's at the nub of the matter, and I'm not sure we've really discussed it. Have we? Well, I think we've, we've touched on it, but, but we d certainly haven't articulated it into a captured bullet point. And I think that the, the two things that I would say about that is, one is, yes, we need to you know, define the set of necessary elements. In other words, what are, what are the questions that we need to have answers for to be able to think about you know, using something? 
Um, and, and to uh, develop those, we're going to have to have interactions with various stakeholders to know what those questions are. The second thing, though, that we haven't represented as I look at the list again is also um, a discussion of the methodologies for how we develop evidence um, and the fact that, um, you know, we can't just default uh, to, the, uh, to the same old, uh, same old, uh, at least in my view, that we have to look at other opportunities. And, and Jeff Roach's slide, I thought, uh, that showed different things that CMS is looking at in terms of evidence, you know, clearly says there's all sorts of different kinds of evidence, and in particular, we need to um, develop real world methodologies that can answer the questions that are going to be identified as we begin to do this work, and that's something that we should we should take away. And so, it, does that kind of capture what? Yeah, it is? I guess what I was talking about was something that's a specific subcomponent of that. Right. which is actually defining what the ideal set of information would be and whether it's ever knowable and what you need to do to get some path along that line of knowability. D does that? So it, we're into epistemology now. Yeah, I, 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 I just let a follow up on that and also on Steve Sherry's comment, which is that what I see is ClinVar sitting there establishing a system and a, essentially a bucket that's going to have well-organized data. The problem I still see is how do you get the data in there? What's the mechanism, the policy by which you're going to get phenotypic information from the place where most variant is being generated, which is in clinical laboratories now? So, yeah, or you can at least comment on it. <laughs> so, so we started out a. Um, talking with Donna and Jim um, about what ClinVar is going, you know, can do, could do. And they are talking to the clinical laboratories. And so Heidi um, has actually put in a grant now. But we've talked with them and we've come up with many of these data elements. What are the evidences that you want to put in? And there's a big long list and so the question now is, how do we get this manageable that, I, that we can submit it? Yeah. Um, we've talked about that it has to have a clinical curation, have to have levels of, that we know this was put in with the research, it was only in one family, as opposed to this is what the clinical community is calling it at this point in time. And whenever we did that, we need to have the evidences behind it of why we are calling it that. And, and so there'll be, you know, at least what I envision from the discussions, um, you know, there's going to be different levels that we could do with it. Heidi has put in a grant um, that hopefully will be funded to get some money to start putting us in these circles. And we're doing the model of Muta Circle, if people have heard about that. So different laboratories who have different expertise and different genes are going to put together circles of those of us that have experts in it. So for example, ARUP, we have some very good biochemical geneticists. We do perform biochemical testing. We can have, get biochemical enzymes. We can take it into a research lab on occasion and try and get a functional study done. And that's kind of an interest of one of our medical, you know, several of our medical directors at ARUP. We've reached out to other laboratories, Mayo Clinic, um, you know, Emory, other places that do the same genes, and said, "Would you be willing to work with us and have a, a conference call and, you know, come up with a consensus and discuss what these are?" And, and so that's the expert curation. Um, so these discussions are going on. It's not to say that we've come up with the solutions but we have at least some ideas. Now what I'm hoping with this grant, if it can get funded, what I need is to take my clinical database, which we do have some clinical information. Um, you know, it's not like an in-depth clinical notes, but we do know the indication for testing. We know if other tests have been done. We, have, we collect family histories. We collect known family mutations. So we have a fair amount of information that can be shared but I can't just dump it into a database, to another database, because this is a clinical one. Mm. I need to, first of all, make sure what I put in is accurate, because sometimes we may have made a mistake in the database and it doesn't really correspond with what I've reported it out as. So we need to go through that. Um, we need to make sure that it's stripped of anything that could be considered 
the PHI. Um, and then we, so then I, I need to get it somehow to get it, build something to take it from our database into the Excel spreadsheet because I can't do that manually. So we've got to build some type of a script so we can do that and put a process in place that it's going to be reasonable. So, so we're do. getting pretty detailed here. So is there a concept that we can extract from what you've been talking about that, that either should be represented under one of the existing bullets or needs to be uh, articulated as a new bullet, something a big overall broad concept? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, the discussions of the data elements of the evidences that we need are being done. The fact that there has to be clinical curation and the fact that there has to be a, a way for clinical labs to, to be able to I I input their data. I guess those are the three main points. The point is to fund Heidi's proposal. The, yeah, fund Heidi's proposal. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I, th I think the bigger picture part of this is that there are major obstacles in getting phenotypic information necessary for in, into the database. And um, I'm a co-PI on Heidi's grant application, so I'm speaking from that stuff. With trying to put that aside, uh, is that um, most clinical laboratories get little or no information about the phenotype. Uh, you may order a test not because you think the patient has this disorder, but because you're trying to rule it out, in which case the phenotype of that information, that person is going to be quite different than a person where you have a high clinical suspicion. So I, I think this issue of how to get the phenotypic data is a huge obstacle, and we don't have a, a good way to do it. Well, and I would argue that I think NHGRI has, has made an important step forward with the Emerge Network because that's precisely what they've been doing, is how do you get information, phenotypic information out of an electronic health record using a portable system that can cross multiple EHRs. So that's, a, I think, an important step that we need to. Yeah, but I think what we need to do is we need to represent that as a bullet of things to do that okay. we have to explore other situations to get the phenotypic information. I think that's a good takeaway that we don't have represented there. So we, could, I'm gonna it, could it be something like decipher for gen genomic <laughs> variants? Yeah. Right, ISCA. the example's already there. Yeah, I mean, ISCA is another example. So again, look at model. Audrey, did you, did you want to say something? You've yeah, been sorry. very patient. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to say something that I thought might be missing is something that we've heard over a couple of days is the need just for more data, particularly on populations, in order to do this well. Yeah, there are a couple of bullets, I think, that do, do, do address that. Okay. Gail? Yeah. So. Um, heard talking about biochemical and, and one area where there is a national collaborative to collect now outcomes data and phenotyping is the newborn screening network. And so um, it's not going to answer a lot of the adult common variants, but as a prototype, since people are already contributing outcomes data and natural history to a central site with all the regions, uh, that might be an area that one could start with. Um, again, as a prototype to start building some of what kind of clinical information will be out there and how to link databases where someone's already collecting some phenotype data. So basically, again, identifying existing models and see how we can extend and, and advance those. Matthew. So, so one opportunity that's been um, not really discussed, although it's touched on tangentially, has been functional studies and the value of functional studies for showing in particular genes which are already known to be clinically valid and clinically useful, functional study of individual variants. I think there's an opportunity for um, potentially scaled functional studies of specific genes of known utility. For example, wouldn't it be great if we knew what the, uh, what the, the consequence of every missense mutation you could possibly have in BRCA1? Uh, now, there are some technologies that are just in the gestation that could potentially do this kind of analysis. And it, would be, it could be very much focused on those genes that are already known to be clinically valid and useful, and it would be a path out of BIN2 that's not, that we haven't currently discussed. So if I can, and for those of you who aren't speaking to your microphones, there's a maximum number that's otherwise the room explodes. Um, so to, to extend that into a broader concept, I think what we're, what we're really saying is explore new ways to assess um, uh, uh, variants uh, that are novel uh, to determine, um, you know, their impact. And so functional studies would be one, there may be other things, but that's the, the under, uh, the overarching um, uh, 
thing. Yeah. Well, and a lot of that gets to sort of the fundamental biology where there's, uh, you know, hundreds of other grants across things like the NIH, which are doing precisely that on a gene by gene basis. Yeah, but it was just very much, very much focused on getting things out of this bin two right. that we can get can get out of bin two, because because uh, those studies are not don't have the same clinical focus. But it is, I think, it's worthwhile just having it as a um, kind of noted as functional studies, because otherwise we're talking very much about informatic solutions and not experimental solutions. Um, Howard, another bullet to add. Um, and Helen gets the credit for reminding me of this one. <clears throat> you asked the question, how will we ever know that we're done? And the answer, of course, is we're never done because another great invention is always around the corner. And one of the things that's been discussed a few times is the need to annotate not just the data, but tools and algorithms and methods and procedures, things that were used to generate what we did need to be annotated as well so that looking back, someone can rationally figure out why something that now looks stupid looked logical at the time. So all the metadata associated with the data is? Yeah. Tim. So part of that is around evaluation of algorithms. There, I mean, I don't know if people know, there is something called KG, which is actually running a competition uh, to, to work out, you know, see if, see if different informatics algorithms, you know, how well they can do. That's happening in California in next December, week. next week. Next week, December 9 and 10. Other things? Elaine. One of the things I would like is to have um, more communications between the clinical lab and research labs that actually could take it into the functional data. When I've tried to reach out to them, there's really not much interest. But if, if we could get a clinical research in a collaborations going on, that what we find in the clinical can go into the research, then back to the clinical. And I'm talking the clinical lab, not necessarily the clinicians. Yeah, I could. Maybe I could just make a quick comment on, on that. It's, it's an important point. One of the interesting things, I think, is, is that we found that there have been people, you know, sort of squirreled away working on their favorite gene for decades, and, and you know, nobody's ever been interested in it. And, and when, you, when you actually find those folks, and, you know, and you can't just go to any research lab. You have to sort of dig in the literature and find the person who's been working on, you know, X, Y, the Fox E1 gene and, you know, 1E, and it, and it turns out to then be related to hypothyroidism, and they go nuts. It's like, oh my goodness, you know, somebody's actually interested in our gene. But, yeah. but that probably will take a little more linking, because you have to figure out which lab and which investigator is really interested in that gene. So it's something to think about. Yeah, I think that, you know, this is a really important function. What we're really talking about here is brokering, mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, who, what group and is can NHGRI or, or some other entity actually provide that brokering function where people, a clinical laboratory could say, gosh, we'd like somebody to do functional studies with this, and you kind of maintain an, uh, a network or some type of a way to bring people together. And I think a lot of the things that we're representing as bullets could benefit from this type of uh, brokering because there are people that are out there doing it. The hard part always is getting them connected. There's a lot of PhD candidates that would love to have a list of potential projects that they could use for their PhD theses that would be a great target for that. Um, I would echo that, but I, I would like to think that it might be useful to have a more formalized approach for that. Because I think one of the problems is, is that um, even if you are a research lab, we've worked on a number of genes which we're no longer working on and I no longer have funding for, but people have contacted me about a gene I found, you know, eight years ago and I have to say, well, I'm sorry, I, I can't work on that now because it's quite difficult to get ongoing small funding of that kind. I also think this issue about how you follow up the BIN2 to, 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 to decide to reassign them is quite difficult to do in the clinical setting because then your clinician has to go back to all these different people, have to counsel them, have to do all these things for something that's probably not going to be um, pathogenic, whereas in that situation it's much easier to do that as a research um, and it's probably more appropriate and potentially quicker to do that and it's more likely to happen. Um, so I wonder whether that is something that's an infrastructure, an actual pathway. There's a variant that's been found. It's, it's, possibly, it's probably going to be innocent, but we'd like to do more work on it. Can we put that into some kind of formalized research or get quick funding for it or allow it so that we can actually get that done? So this sounds uh, remarkably like a valley of death issue. Uh, so Eric, I might put you on the spot and just ask if you think that this is something where the new Center for Translation, uh, Advancement Translational Sciences could potentially play a role. I would be, I would be very cautious in making any promises about, about that new center because 
everybody sees it in a different way and it's not that big and it has its own agenda. And, uh, you know, I think if you want to see progress on this more quickly, I would not, I mean, first of all, the center doesn't even exist yet. Um, so I, 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 I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, count on that. If you think this is high priority, I think you should be telling us this and have other institutes figure out how to make it happen. Yeah, so I just wanted to kind of, I think one maybe bullet could be to clarify what we mean by binning. And, you know, I sort of propose one definition of it. People have used it in different ways, I think, here. And, you know, for, from my perspective, binning isn't about whether we understand what the variant does or not. It's not a question of is it a known pathogenic or VUS. It's a matter of is it clinically actionable or it, does it have clinical utility or does it have clinical validity but no um, defined uh, clinical interventions. That's my personal definition. Obviously, everybody can, you know, take that idea and run and, and call it other things. But I think the issue of, you know, whether you move things from bin two to bin one has to do with can we demonstrate that there's clinical outcome improvement by doing something with that information? That's a, a research question. The question of whether we can change a VUS into a redefined variant as a known pathogenic or known benign variant, that's to me a different question. So I just want to, you know, but both important, obviously. So in thinking about that, I'm, I'm thinking about ClinVar and, and the information that would get aggregated. And I think there's maybe two types, of, two roles that might serve. One is aggregation of evidence data that needs to go into the adjudication process to, to evaluate clinical utility then there's another role, which is submit, you know, transmitting the messages out, which, which need to be def defined, structured about if there is clinical <coughs> utility, what is it, what's the evidence, how would it go into a, dis you know, a decision support system? And I don't know if a workshop could cover both of those topics, but I, there's not a lot of structure in the messaging world right now for the clinical information. And I think we could put a, a fine point on some of these questions when we actually get down to that level of saying, here's the specification of how the data should exchange, or here's the specification of the data we want to judge and, and the, you know, the algorithms we use and how we're going to record it. it you know, it, it's going to follow it in a great deal from that. Five minutes to go. Other comments? If you have a wish, we're all ears. <laughs> so I would like some help getting um, a Bayesian type analysis so I can know that if I reach a 99% to be able to call it pathogenic versus a 95%. Right now, it sounds like all of us are just kind of picking those numbers out of the hat. So if there, and I know that people have worked on statistical methods. I don't know how to get those translated into the clinical. Mark, the first time I met you, we were talking about this, yeah. and I'm still struggling. Yeah, well, and, and, and there's no obvious solutions to this. I'm, I'm reminded of Lewis Carroll, whose character Humpty Dumpty probably said it the best, you know, pathogenicity is exactly, it means exactly what I say, it means neither more nor less. <laughs> um, and so in some ways, I think, that we, you know, we, we, we do the best we can, um, and uh, we have to, but we have to be able to do better. And I think one of the things that uh, 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 you demonstrated in your talk is, is uh, you know, which relates to directly what Howard was talking about earlier, is how do we help clinicians visualize that and understand what it is exactly that we mean when we say that this is unknown or uncertain or that this is definitely yes or definitely no. Um, and it's, uh, those, are, those are rich areas where, that haven't been well explored and we need to do a better job. All right, well then. Uh, we can officially declare uh, victory. The, the <laughs> uh, I think the first, the first skirmish has been won, maybe, but uh, the war still remains. So the, goal, the next steps then for this is um, we'll write up these recommendations and share them around with this group in the next few weeks. We'll probably ask for a fairly quick turnaround time on, on these. So I'm sure you'll all be watching your email inboxes with bated breath waiting for this, uh, e this, this, this set of recommendations to arrive. Uh, everybody should know that the video from this is going to be posted online together with the slides. Uh, so if you have slide issues that you need to fix, you should make sure you get those fixed. Um, and those will go on to genome.gov at some point in the next 
few weeks, couple of weeks. Um, and then the ultimate goal is to develop a manuscript from these discussions that uh, will be shared around as well. Most importantly, thank all of you for all your time uh, over the last two days. This has been an extraordinarily um, intellectually stimulating meeting. Uh, I think it's been productive. I, I know from some hallway conversations that uh, if nothing else comes out of this, we've already uh, gotten some people together to do some fun things uh, that might not have otherwise gotten together. So that in and of itself, I think, could be a metric of success. I want to again thank Aaron and Karina for all their hard work in terms of uh, uh, organizing this. Um, and yes. And safe travels uh, to your homes.